trying to clear some of the misfolded proteins that accumulate in major organs in patients with light chain amyloidosis. We are here talking to uh, Dr. Maury Gertz, who is an MD, Chair of Internal Medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. This is a condition that's really hard on some of the major organs, like the heart and the kidneys. What is it you're looking for here in this phase one, phase two study that we're talking about? All right, historically for the last 40 years, we've used chemotherapy to destroy the plasma cells that produce the light chain proteins that misfold. But that doesn't do anything for the established deposits of amyloid and does nothing for any soluble toxic intermediates. So there are many patients who get chemotherapy and no longer produce amyloid, but still have major organ dysfunction that's risk of death dialysis. Here we have an antibody that binds only to the amyloid and not to immunoglobulin. And the goal is to see if it will actually remove from tissues the deposited amyloid. So in the trial that we'll be reporting today, we've taken patients who've already had maximum benefit from chemotherapy, but have persistent problems, particularly with their heart and with their kidney, and then administer the antibody monthly dose escalation to determine the maximum tolerated dose, and then determine if there's sufficient signal to proceed with a phase three trial. So what did you learn? We found that 60% of the cardiac patients had a major reduction in NT pro BNP, a major biomarker of heart failure, and approximately 60% of patients with renal amyloid had a 30% reduction of urinary protein loss, which means sparing of the kidneys and reduced risk of dialysis. The signal was sufficiently exciting that we're going to be moving on to a phase three trial of chemotherapy plus antibody, NeoD1, versus placebo plus chemotherapy in newly diagnosed untreated patients with light chain amyloid. What about safety? Was that an issue? No. Uh, the only thing we saw grade three, four was hyponatremia. In two patients of 27, both of those were attributed to diuretic usage in their heart failure and not due to the drug. There were no infusion-related reactions, interestingly. Did patients feel better? We didn't do quality of life studies during it, but uh, anecdotally, the patients who had reduction in their NT pro BNP seemed to have improved exertion and improved effort. I believe the urinary protein reduction will translate into a reduced risk of end stage renal disease. I think it's a great story, so thank you for sharing it with us. One of the other things that I wanted to ask you about was what you think are some of the highlights from the ASCO meeting this year in terms of amyloidosis, myelodysplastic syndrome, or myeloma. What's the news out of this meeting? So my focus has been on multiple myeloma, and there really was an amazing amount of material. Uh, first of all, some of the newly developed drugs, antibodies, daratumumab, anti-CD38, shows high level activity in very heavily pretreated patients with multiple myeloma. So a truly new class of drugs when chemotherapy fails. Also elotuzumab, the anti-SLAM7 drug, also showed activity in combination with lenalidomide and dexamethasone, producing an improved progression-free survival compared to the regimen without the antibody. We saw new uses for the histone deacetylase inhibitor panabinostat. Uh, it uh, has shown in use uh, with bortezomib improved progression-free survival. Now it's been analyzed in patients who are dual refractory to proteasome inhibitors and immunomodulatory drugs and shows both improved progression-free survival and a higher proportion of complete and near complete responses, deeper responses that translate to even longer progression-free survival. Moreover, panabinostat has now been combined with carfilzomib and lenalidomide, and the toxicity that previously was reported, fatigue and diarrhea, was seen in only a very small percentage, so a much better tolerated combination. There was a phase three trial of carfilzomib dexamethasone to bortezomib dexamethasone, showing a improved clinical outcome with the carfilzomib regimen and much lower toxicity, particularly neurotoxicity. A new regimen for induction prior to transplant included carfilzomib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone, followed by an autotransplant, followed by consolidation therapy, response rates 100%, complete response rates 100%, but more importantly, minimal residual disease negativity which is our measure to see who might be cured, 87%. So that was remarkable. 
There was one other trial in transplant eligible patients that looked at bortezomib consolidation versus no consolidation, strongly favoring the use of bortezomib consolidation after transplantation. Hematologically speaking, it seems like there's a, a variety of good news items out of this meeting. Oh, the, the tempo at which new agents are being developed and smart combinations uh, are really turning into great news for our patients. Patients that, when I started, lived two to three years, now are living seven and eight years, and based on what I'm seeing at this meeting, are going to push past the 10-year barrier. Uh, congratulations. I think this is, is exciting, and it is good for patients as well as doctors, although you're going to have a job trying to learn all this stuff now. It's a great meeting. It's, it takes a little while to digest all the information, and we have a bewildering number of choices, but that isn't all bad. Yeah, absolutely. And looking at a, around on uh, online or in uh, ASH Clinical News, please take a look at all of the news that is coming out of ASCO 2015. I'm Rick McGuire here in Chicago.